Ah, Maybe. fantastic. Maybe I... It's not quite my right side, Mr. DeVille. Well, do you want to swap sides? Thank you. <laughs> hey. Hello. Lovely. Come on down. Give everyone a couple of, a, a minute more. It's quite comfortable sitting here. Okay. Yeah, so you can swing your legs. Yeah, I can swing my legs. Yeah, I haven't done that since I was 12. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, shall we get, shall we, cut, uh, shall we uh, crack on? Uh, well, you're in, uh, you're, you're in charge. Well, <coughs> I like we'll, to think we'll so. Think so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like to think so. Right. So, I know everyone's going to want to hear about Doctor Who, but let's, let's, let's start with Harry Potter, shall we? It's a new yes. Yeah, so, um, I didn't realise that you were in, Do uh, in um, Doctor Who, I didn't realise you were in Doctor Who. I didn't realise you were in, in Harry Potter until I did a little bit of research the other day, and then, uh, there you were, popping up out of, the, out of the floor. Well, I was very nearly not in it. Right. Uh, for those who don't know, it was cast as the Fat Friar of Hufflepuff House. So I was one of the four major ghosts. It was a, a very laborious audition. Um, it, first of all, there was 20 of us, and then we had to go for another one, and there were 13, and then there were seven, and then it's down to the last three. It was a, so by the time they offered me the part, it was more well, about bloody time, <laughs> rather than all the excitement of it. And, and then, of course, it was lovely. It was five weeks work, and got to work with Rick Mayo. Uh, and then most of it was all cut. Oh, you were with yeah. Rick Mail as well? Rick Mail was, uh, yeah, he was the um, Peeves, the Poltergeist. Oh, um, I didn't realise that, that Peeves was actually going to be in there. He would have been well, amazing. Well, that's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. It, the, I always know the Harry Potter fan who read the book, and those who've only known it from the films. Because if I mention the Death Day party and uh, Peeves, the Poltergeist, those who haven't read the book Please, But no, there was a lot, but Rick Mail, for whatever reason, was cut out altogether. And the rest of the stuff that we used was cut out. But I do clean off for a few seconds Coming at out. the sorting ceremony and the philosopher's stone. And I joke now when I talk to uh, drama students that my name in the credits is on screen longer than I am. <laughs> but, but that. But that show be lovely. And, uh, and when you read autobiographies and biographies of the good and the great, they've all got similar stories. Well, um, it's, it's part and parcel of uh, the, the industry. It's all part and parcel of it, yes. But yeah, I, I, I'm actually really shocked that, um, that Rick Mayo, I mean, I can't think of anyone better to play Peeves, to be honest. Well, exactly, and we had such fun. And he was very professional, and he made us rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And then when we filmed it, he did completely opposite of what was going <laughs> So I, I, want to, I want to see some of it, just to see our own expressions going... <laughs> but, um, but it was a wonderful time. Uh, I learned a lot. And, um, but it was a disappointing experience. I can, I can imagine. Um, yeah, because I, I knew that the, the ghosts had a bigger role yeah. But, but uh, I didn't realise that it had been cut so much because I would have loved to have seen that. I mean, that must have been incredibly well, fun. Uh, as an actor, you get used to a lot of what, what you feel doesn't appear. And uh, I have to say, the Doctor Who was quite the reverse. Everything that Dora gets to speak is in the show. And there are a couple of scenes where Dora is just a super good where it doesn't appear. But um, I'm very chuffed. Well, originally it was a, a one-off character, really, wasn't it? And well, that was it. I must admit, when I was offered the role of Dora, um, I was a bit disappointed. It was just this one scene in the Pandora's home. And even before the whole story starts, really. It's, yeah. the, it's uh, before the opening credits. Well, you were dying. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I was disappointed. So I was naturally chuffed to be asked to come back for uh, A Good Man Goes to War. But then, of course, or he loses his head. 
That is true. Uh, but you, put, you play a very, very pivotal character, though. Oh, well, he, uh, he's a storyteller, and, he, and Dorian clearly knows a lot about the Doctor's future. Yeah. Uh, so I did the try and sow this seed of a spin-off scene. <laughs> Well, it would be amazing. Because he wouldn't have had, you know, the vortex in it without not trying. See, so he would have tried. So he could have all sorts of scenarios. He should, he should be. Up. And we don't know who was Dorian's first doctor. Yeah, it, it, could, it could be, be number anyone. 23 with my uncle. Yeah, it could be anyone. And, uh, <laughs> but um, it fell on fun and ground. You should pitch it to Big Finish. Go to Big Finish. Oh, to a Big Finish. Uh, uh, Mark Gatiss himself, right? It's different the idea. Uh, to which you went, hmm. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the yeah. idea of it, though, because... Maybe you never know. You know, as you say, he's a storyteller, and I, I can envisage um, him telling these stories of... Um, it, it, you know, narrating the stories, or, or just just telling the story without having to. Act, you, you could you could in an audio specifically, it could be a great thing to do. Because well, I'm pleased we've been finished in finish you know, that they started to bring Dorian back. Yeah. Dorian appears in the, the Eleven Doctor Chronicles and the spin-off series Jen. Yeah. And uh, the Jen second series complete Dorian. So that's very really pleasing. Yes, they could easily be, but we could all argue that. We're not. That's true, we that is true. Yes. We're always doubting. <laughs> Actor so, never retires, the, the phone just stops ringing. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. Um, so, did you feel an affinity to the, um, to the character? I, mean, you, you, the, the, I get from the way you speak about him that you had you know, an attachment to the character. Um, well, what I like about Dor, and I have to say, I get very disappointed when people criticise Stephen Fitzroy. All I can say is for Dorian, he's perfect. He's created a multi, multi-layered character, it's like an onion. He can be very funny. He can be very frightening, and a bit in between as well. So that's what I like about Dor. I mean, always had to play, have exercised him to play the master. But the way the master is portrayed at the moment is that he's just very too blind. He's just an evil person. I'm a bad, and I'll always be bad. Uh, whereas Dorian can be bad. Yeah. But there's a there's a kind of side to it as well. Well, I think I think he's a, a, a far more. Um multi-layered character as you say and I think there's a bit of good and bad I think he, he might be out for himself a little bit more you know? well I, I think I sort of identify with in a way Dorian I think is quite a decent character but he seems here to earn his money and uh, get on better with the people who live on the dark side of the uh, and that's also control him and uh, in some ways, working in our industry, it's a bit like right? uh, There's curious things that go on that nobody knows about, that you, we live and bear it, and above all, try and enjoy it. Yeah. There are stories to be told when I'm good and happy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so I think we need to hear those stories. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you, you say that you're you know, a bit disappointed when, when you first got the role, but um, what, were you, what was your first thoughts when you um, sort of got on set? What was that like? What was it like meeting the, the other character? I mean, it looks, it, these days it can be very deceiving, but it, I mean, it looks like the, the, the sets were, were um, incredible, but how much of that was there? How much was it CG? How much was the interaction with the, the characters? Very interested in that. Well, with the Pandora opens, it was actually filmed down in the bowels of a wine bar in Cardiff. Really? And the space was very tiny. Very it looked, tiny indeed. It looked incredibly and so big. They had this largest table at which uh, Dr. Thomas Oral was sat at. And then you have to take into account um, extra 
first, the correct first, the juice first, the costume, the makeup, the sound crew, the camera. And well, one of the cameras was actually on a dolly, uh, to buy for both. So it was extremely tough. Um, and when I went to the audition, said um, set homage to Star Wars. And I must have been set in the Star Wars. And there were lots of other aliens around. So that was rather that cool. And when it came to the other episodes, the sets themselves were all very painful. They were all very what, sorry? Basic. Oh, really? Yeah, I was, I was really surprised. Uh, and even some of the explosions of things were more of a fit uh, than an actual because what they do in post-production. Oh, can you move your hand off the bottom of the mic? Can I? Just covering the aerial, you see the top of the microphone. Oh, for the, the aerial bit. So you just hold up here a little bit. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go, you've been told. I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm used to the pelt. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so to ask, answer your question, it was all wonderful, and some of it was fantastic. I mean, down in the cabin there. Um, technical issue. Oh, there we go. Technical. Technical issue. That's nice, There we I go. I, I, I just thought I was talking in a funny way. <laughs> I thought you were going through a tunnel. Yes. Where you, uh, might, okay. um, uh, the cabin where um, Dorian's head was in the box. And they had all the skulls in it. Uh, they kept on dressing it with cobwebs. <laughs> and I learned that there's cobwebs in a can. I never knew there was such cobwebs in a can. Well, they sprayed on them. Yeah, and there was this girl, she was extremely proficient in that she shook the can and she sprayed it. She used to shoot it up in the air and then it would come down. It would land exactly where she was. And she did it every single time. She'd done that before. Yeah, and, uh, and so I found that was a skill set. <laughs> she learned uh, unexpected. But even, so in that sense, it's quite interesting watching special things going on around you. But it's not until they've done all the post production stuff that you actually then get to see how it looks. Yeah, they fixed it in post. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, what was it like uh, in makeup? Because um, it, it, the makeup was. Very, it was amazing, but it looks like it probably yes, wasn't well, great getting um, it done. Stephen Moffat came to me and said, do you mind if we shave your head? And he explained that with HD, a skull cap looks like a skull cap. And of course, it's Doctor Who, it's Stephen Moffat. No reason in my language at that point. So I went, yes, of course. And I was pleasantly surprised. I didn't find until wait for later. I got paid 35 pounds to have my head shaved. They, they paid you for a haircut. Yeah, and at that time I only paid ten quid for a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> so then, I don't even pay that. I do it myself. Anyway, so when I was uh, looking at myself in the mirror, and they started to, uh, they shaved the hair and they put uh, some sort of barrier cream on, and then they slapped on this, and it was bright Thomas the Tank Engine blue, not the blue that you see on the, in the pictures. Of it, so. And, it, and I could see straight away that it was an iconic look. Mm. And, um, sorry, what was it? What was it? What was it like? <laughs> okay. So it was very strange. The only thing we discovered is that my head is very strangely shaped. And so I put my the front of my head comes up and then it dips down. It's got like a little pond area. And then it comes up again. And at the back of my head looks like the dark side of the moon. So all this discussion about skull caps <laughs> flew out the window. But it was really good fun. Uh, and uh, they put black eyeliner on the bottom eye uh, which affected my eyes. Right. Uh, which made them water. And of course, it's the heat effect. How is it you made your eyes look so glistening so much? I said, very easy. You stick a mascara brush. You know? <laughs> I was going to ask if you wore um, uh, yeah. contacts. Uh, no, no, no. It's a, uh, that, that, that's always. And of course, they, they, they just painted my hands. I have a uh, blue uh, fingernail uh, nail polish. Uh, and that was it. And then they sprayed this gadol 
fixing it, which is like a hairspray, and um, it tasted vile. I don't think it's meant to eat it. No, 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 but it's in the air. <laughs> and it really didn't work, because, you know, I had to, I was doing the scene looking this way, and as I turn around, I get a, a sponge in my face if they re-damage me. So, but it was, it was a huge fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And when I was asked back, I was actually chuffed. And when you come back, you become, you find that you're part of the family. And they all come back and give you a big hug. And, well, and of course, cool. he lost the head. And then I got a phone call about a month later from my agent. He said, well, I don't know what you're doing, but they want you back. <laughs> and I thought, well, wow, that's nice confidence. conversation from your agent. Uh, but anyway, uh, and of course I thought it might be in the backstory, because you know there's a backstory drawing and some others have to have. They owe the doctor a debt, and people still ask me what that debt is. Uh, and so I thought it might be the backstory for that, but no, it was the head of the box. <laughs> there you go. Well, this is, uh, yeah, I was going to, I was going to say that, I mean, there is still that, those questions, isn't there? There's lots yeah. of questions. I mentioned this in my books. This is where I do my, um, plug. Um, Go ahead, uh, plug, plug away. I do conventional things, uh, I do panels like this. And people did ask if I had an autobiography, which I never thought about. Who would want to know anything about me at the time? So I, I did a play which I toured, and a publisher came and said that uh, we must put this into book form. So I have three books. Oh, wow. My darling has a punch. <laughs> which is sort of. It's not, it's more um, autobiographical anecdotes. Uh, so it is my autobiography, but it's anecdotes as well, explaining certain situations. And also a few tips about how to deal with authorities and utility bill companies and things like that. Something that we all need right so, now. Then there's, my Dalek has another function, which it really says exactly what I've been talking about today. It tells you what it was like working on Dr. Who and how things changed for me. And one of the, uh, what do you call it? One of the spin-offs of the books and doing the talks is people come and, to me and say, when you say dot, 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 they then start to recount their similar story. And then they then go on to ask you to talk about it. So I've sort of become an agony uncle. So my third in my trilogy is called um, Let Zygons Be Zygons. Ah, uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, to, to keep people with the doctor, keep it, which is really good. The books you can buy, um, well, you can buy some today, they're at my desk, uh, or you can buy them online from Amazon, or go to Fantastic Books Publishing. But more recently, and I would say in the summer, I've had a number of people contact me to ask if the audio book could be available on CD. CD? On CD, which, and of course I thought CDs were a big of the past. But no, no, my I'm son doesn't even know what they are. No, I talked to, it's a foreign language to my yeah. But a lot of people are asking about it. And oh. rather curiously, I have, I've got them down, I've got uh, which you can also get on my table. Um, uh, some people don't want them on that. Yes. They just want them to see them. Yeah. So they're just buying the product. I suppose with the hope that in a hundred years' time they might be worth it. But, uh, well, but you yeah, well, but people are welcome to purchase them for any reason. It would be nice if they listen to them, but, but uh, it doesn't matter. But they're available. Lovely. So does anyone have any questions? Now's the time. Now's the time. Any questions? Come on up. Come on up to the, the microphone. Come on down, as somebody used to say. Oh, Price is right. What was it like working with Matt Smith? Well, it's, it's like with the entire crew. A whole uh, Doctor Who crew and actors. And, I mean, most of them are absolutely delightful. Matt Smith was particularly special. Because I, I remember William Hartnell, that's how old I am. And I always said that Patrick Troughton was my doctor. Because I remember, because I was about five when he changed, William Hartnell changed to Baxter Town. But Matt Smith, of course, was my special doctor because I got to work with him. And, um, you know, he's quite shy on the corner. 
But once he gets to know you, he's quite cheap. I'm sure he looks like it. And he, 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 he come past my trailer and he goes, Morning, Sal! I hate people, Sal. <laughs> uh, but it's Matt Smith and it's Doctor Who. So what are you going to do? I have to say. Um, and then it's very, it's a very general thing. And in the head of the box scene in particular, um, there are shots where you just see Matt Smith's shoulders. Yes, he's looking at me and you can see me looking at him. And normally in those situations, they put a stand in. But Matt Smith insisted that he would do it himself. And it's everything. I then soon found out why. Because whilst I'm trying to be very dramatic and adoring, uh, he's got this twinkle in his eye. He's trying to make me laugh. <laughs> um, but on the other side of the car, I can tell you, Basically, for the head of the box, uh, they filmed the print, and then they took the print away, and they stuck a chair, and I sat there. They then put over me a large box with my head stuck out, and that was covered in green. And then they put door in the box, and door in the door would close. You know, it got extremely hot within a microsecond of it closing. The each of these set this sweat was pouring into my arms. Um, let me, and on this particular tape, it was like, right, ready? Right, ready. So they closed the door, and then couldn't hear, I'm saying, couldn't hear anything at all. And what it is, they all got together and started another conflict, you know, <laughs> about this and that, the other. I don't even know if they were talking about the scene or anywhere. But then I heard Matt say, Oh, we've forgotten Simon, who he came over, and he opened the door, and I tell you, it literally was, shh, is it? <laughs> oh, Simon, are you all right? Sorry, is it? And he made sure they got me, not just water, but ice. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. And it was he, not not some minion, uh, or, or whatever, it was he who did that. So they did, and they just highlights, uh, what a very genuine person they did. Sounds like a lovely man. And I'm, Really quite terrified on set. Because she was there, particularly with Doctor Who, because it's a tight, tight time frame. It's a 10 day corporate. So everything has to be done for each episode. Uh, so you don't want to mess it up. No, absolutely. It's a really, really good fun. So, does anyone have any other questions? You're Speak desperate. now! You're come on, come on, come on! Yes. Come up to the microphone, please. <laughs> this way. That's right, to the front. There we go. Did you get to the front? What? Into the microphone? Did you get to the front? Did you get to the front? Did you get to keep any microphones? Well, the blue. <laughs> oh, there nice. Was, there was some real, real costume jewelry. They're not worth anything. Are you telling me they weren't real? The movie magic! <laughs> now, when, when I first became Dora, uh, they invited me to, uh, I've forgotten the name of the costumes now, uh, Angels. Angels, which are based in Hendon in North London. And it really is brilliant. It's a, it's a real toy box. You go in and then rows and rows and rows of costumes. And then there was this little room, and the main costume they got for Dora, I could see hanging up on the wall. Anyway, they got me dressed and I was looking in the mirror and they said, is there anything else you think Dora would have? So I said, well, I think you'd have a bit of blue. Right? So they went away, came back with quite a large box. And that's where they got the room. But hanging out, there was this chain. And it had a crescent-shaped moon uh, emblem on it. And I said, oh, that looks interesting. Let's have a look at that. And then, like the magician's come up, he just came out, re rolled for yards and yards ahead, and they wound it around it. And I thought, oh, this looks, I think, yes, then definitely this is Dora. So when it came to a good man goes to war and we're introduced to the Moldavarian, the logo for the Moldavarian is a crescent moon. Now, I'm sure it's not the case, but I like to think, and I'm going to think, cling on to it uh, with all my life that, that was my influence on the scene. If I hadn't have chosen that chain, 
But then that leads me on to something. Now, you will have to stop me because I will carry on talking. I was, I was just about to say we have to, we have to call it there because it's now quarter past eight. All right. Uh, about, yes. uh, okay, let's get to one quick story. Yes, one, 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 one quick. You're, you're in charge, sir. Good man goes to war, director Peter Hall. He said at the end, we did a read through, he said, if you want to discuss your character, and do make contact, he gave us his um, email and uh, mobile number. Couldn't get hold of him on the mobile, so I sent him an email. And in the email, I said, that Dorian, uh, to, uh, to show his power, when he's talking to different people, he'll be doing something else, counting money or doing something with his hands. I also suggest that somebody should at some point go up to Dorian with a gun and he just dismissively pushes it away. Well, I heard nothing, absolutely nothing. But when it came to filming the scene with Madame Cavalier, my French lady, marvellous Francis Barber, the um, props guy came up, he said, Hello Dorian, this is your box. I thought, of course, he opened up the box and there was stones and money and goodness love and all. And then somebody else came up, Oh, well, these two guys have got the guns, they're going to prove to you. So, wow. they, so they obviously read my email and uh, took something from it, but no one said it. That's fascinating, that's amazing. Well, that was all you. So, I, and you'll see it, I, it's, it's in my book. My garlic has another function, which you can either read or hear. And, uh, but it was, so people often ask, do you get a chance uh, to influence anything you're working on? And I'm going to take it that that was my chance. Absolutely. So They'll probably argue otherwise, they always do. <laughs> so thank you so much, Simon. Really thank appreciate you. your time. All right, thank you. Thank you. Lovely, thank you so much. Thank you. Now this is going to be fun. Shall we move some chairs? No, I'll move? just reverse that. Okay. I'll, I'll come over a bit beep, later. Beep, beep, I've, got a, I've got an anecdote from, of um, Rick Mayo because I worked backstage on the bottom tour. Oh, yes. And I'll tell you something about them when I yeah. <laughs> come over. Yeah. Beep, beep. Beep, beep. Can I just something? Big finish, big finish, big finish, yeah, it's all the end. They're all Yes. Yeah, big finish.com. There is, uh, there's 20 years worth of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Big finish.com. 